Oh, it's the hardest part of the ring. Yeah, it's the hardest part of the ring. Sometimes you go over the top rope and you bang your head on the ring apron. And that's when you feel like a big dope. Cause they're the worst bumps you could be taking. Oh, it's the hardest part of the ring. Yes, it's the hardest part of the ring. Ba -da -ba -da. Hey, welcome to the hardest part of the ring. It's me, Bob. Uh, you may hear noise in the background. They're doing construction on the apartment on the other side of the wall. Uh, so you might hear some scraping, some scratching, some music from a language I don't understand. But whatever. Okay, we're going to talk about the hardest part of the ring. That was the new hardest part of the ring theme song uh, I did up top. Um, I think I'll give the, uh, the, the, the other songs sung by someone's drunk uncle who's kind of good at bowling and from Long Island. I'll give those songs a break for a while. I'll, I'll try to grill the hardest part, drill the hardest part of the ring theme song into your head. I hope you enjoyed it, Mark. And, and uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, we're talking about the Hulu edition, the Hulu edition of WWE Monday Night Raw, which does not include the already trending Nia Jax whole thing. Okay, they didn't put that match or the Naomi Shayna Baszler match on Hulu. However. I went out of my way to watch the YouTube, uh, WWE's YouTube version of Nia Jax versus Lana, the infamous whole match, and I'm going to talk about that as a bonus at the end, because I have a couple of things I want to say about that. I'm a little dry, I'm a little parched, I'm going to have some water, hang on. Mm. That is good water. It's important to stay hydrated, it prevents fatigue and headaches. Okie dokie. Let's talk about wrestling. Uh, I finally found out the Elimination Chamber is on Sunday the 21st. And next Sunday the 14th is NXT TakeOver. So there'll be a handful of these coming around. Uh, thankfully, they don't expect any of their NXT fans to be busy on Valentine's Day. And I guess I'm proving them right. We start off not with Hulk Hogan slamming onto the giant, as we are prone to do. But we start off with an in-memoria of Butch Reed. The natural Butch Reed. Who, uh... Some of you may remember, um, if, you, if you're in, in my group, in my mini-generation, we most remember Butch Reed as one half of the popular tag team Doom, featuring himself and Ron Simmons in the early 90s, 1990 WCW. Uh, Doom was a great team. They, uh, they definitely captured my imagination as a 10-year-old. Uh, my Butch Reed memories, I, I know uh, Mania 7, defeating Coco Beware. Uh, I, I was not really at the right age or in the right geographic region to experience his Florida stuff or his Mid-South working for Bill Watts, things or anything like that. Uh, I know of them, but, you know, I, I was born where I were and when I was born, and that's why I most know Butch Reed as being one half of Doom. Coincidentally, Ron Simmons and JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield, are in a fun uh, Untold WWE Network documentary called WWE Untold, except they just told it. So when you air it, it's been told, which really negates the entire operation. After memory of Butch Reed, we have a big, sweaty, manly, meaty package slapping us on the chin of Sheamus no longer being Drew McIntyre's friend. And then um, Adam Pierce arrives to make an announcement. But he needs Shane McMahon to come back, and the computers go wild for Shane McMahon. He needs Shane McMahon to come back and help him make the announcement. And they say that Drew will defend the chamber, the, he'll defend his title in the chamber, at the chamber. Why? Why? Is he being punished for something? I don't, I don't understand what, what that's... And most multi-man matches, multi-person matches, excuse me, pardon me. They'll cancel the show, both my listeners will leave me. Uh, most of those the champion usually retains, but the Fe let me just sidetrack a little bit. The February pay-per-view, whether it's Elimination Chamber, I know it's been fast lane a year or two, or Roadblock, or whatever the hell it's been. No way out for years and years, whatever. That's one of the hardest freaking pay-per-views for them to do, so I kind of don't get mad at it when it's not that good. Because something has to happen, because it's a pay-per-view event. But at the same time, not too much can happen because WrestleMania is coming. So we may f it's basically a glorified ceremony with matches to find out what's going to happen at WrestleMania. Uh, you can't get too mad at it. So 
just no going. I think that would be if I were on the team that would the February one for me would be like the hardest one to, to book or write or whatever you want to call it. Just because something's gotta happen but not too much. The Saturday night's main events over the years in February and March were really uh, really good at it, but they they had less TV time and they really only had to, really only had to further like one or two angles. Um, this couldn't be more patronizing. So Shane McMahon is there to like basically pat Pierce on the head and tell him he's doing a good job. And. Why does he need that approval? And then Shane walks up the ramp, AJ Styles and the Hamas guy go down the ramp. Every superstar, including the babyfaces, has had to back off of the Omas guy as if this is a serious new monster they don't understand. Shane McMahon smirks at him and looks tough. Of course. Of course. Just why would you why would Shane help? I don't know. AJ Styles tells Adam Pierce he always thought he was a dumbass. I appreciated that. Um, Drew McIntyre and what? Oh, Drew McIntyre and Shane McMahon are backstage. And of course, Shane McMahon has to be a patronizing dick to Drew McIntyre and pat him on the belt, which is where his shoulder is. Like, be like a tough guy. Like, um, so what did Shane, Shane can't put anyone over or their abilities? Uh, just because he gets pinned after going in even 20 minutes with him sometimes doesn't mean he's, he's putting them over doing them any favors. So this was all a big waste. I didn't care to see Shane McMahon back. Because uh, he, he always does this. He does what Goldberg does. He does, does what Nia Jax does. So that's doesn't help. AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy uh, are having their match. Two of the greatest of all time. On, it, it was a little... I hate saying it was a little boring, and I don't mean because it was starting slow or whatever. I hate when fans go off. You know, Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle was great, but it actually started kind of slow. No, idiots. It was building, okay? Same thing with Shawn and Brett in the Iron Man. Uh, you have to... You'll get there. But, you know, you don't start off a Batman movie with Batman just punching the fuck everybody. But anyway... Uh, it just wasn't that, I don't know what, it just wasn't their night, but then she, AJ did some great heel stuff on, uh, Jeff Hardy hurts his leg, doing it up and over, he twists his knee or whatever, AJ's beating up his knee, and then they go to break, because that's when it got interesting, so they had to go to break, because they don't like to give us stuff we like, and, uh, so AJ was being great, the story being here, they're both outstanding athletes, but AJ is just being a dick, because he's just choosing to be a dick, a situation came along, and he acted like a dick about it, to remind you who the heel was. And he got his heat on Jeff. You know, he eventually taps out Jeff. So, um, this makes the, uh, he, with his, his maneuver there, uh, I was thinking about Jeff as I'm watching this, and I know there are fans who are like, you know, he's just playing a Hardy music and dressing like the old Jeff Hardy. was. And if he wore new tights, I've never seen Jeff in tights. Um, I know in the 90s he was a job, and no, uh, Hans Talent, and he wore tights. I get it. But if Jeff looked completely different and had no music, you'd go, this sucks, I want the old Jeff Hardy. Why would they just give us the Jeff Hardy if you want? So you can't please everybody. But Jeff taps out to the, the calf crusher there. I'm wondering if this was some kind of out to, to not have Jeff in a match. Because Jeff was the odd one. He's definitely a top guy and a Hall of Famer, and in my opinion, and probably most people's. But he hasn't been booked as a top guy. He's like him and Rey Mysterio kind of run neck and neck in these roles. They're just, a, you know, they can lose forever and they'll be over forever because they are who they are. Uh, I'm wondering if this was an excuse to get Jeff out of the match and put someone else in, which I thought was going to be Keith Lee, but then, then later on we'll see we're, we'll do something else with, else with Keith. Uh, maybe the Fiend in the Chamber to finish the Orton thing. And then we'll talk about that too later. The name of the show is Hardest Part of the Ring. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, we have a graphic showing us Riddle and Keith Lee will be wrestling tonight. That'll be nice. Backstage, Keith Lee is warming up. Keith Lee gets interrupted the most when warming up for a match. Have you noticed that? As usually when we see Keith Lee, he's doing like a little, like a back stretch. Not a little, he's huge. He's doing like a back stretch. He's warming up his arms or something, and someone always comes and bothers him. So Riddle comes up and bothers him with a black eye, and uh, they go back and forth. Riddle was going on about Air Buds, which I guess is a popular kid's movie about a dog who plays basketball or something. 
and I was trying to really hate it, but it, but it amused me, it entertained me. Riddle is one of the few who is making the chicken salad. They're giving him some some stupid things to say and do, and he's running with them as much as he can. I said, believe it or not, this may sound crazy. Lacey Evans, kind of too, in that same category. We'll talk about it later. Again, this is it. I wonder what it's. Boy, the later part of this episode is going to be crazy. Adam Pierce is uh, talking to Seamus. Oh yeah, so so Riddle and Keith Lee just kind of uh, oh, all right, best man wins. Blah blah blah. Uh, I don't know if these baby faces matches, baby face matches are doing much for Keith. He just had the big one with Drew, but we'll see. Uh, Adam Pierce is getting yelled at by Sheamus. Sheamus is yelling like way too close. You, it's bad enough we got these guys with no masks when half of them are testing, not half, but a chunk of them are testing positive for COVID every year and there, every now and then. Keith Lee, you know, Mia Yim just tested positive, and Keith Lee had obviously close contact, and, uh, their champion, Drew, was out for two weeks and almost missed the Rumble, for fuck's sake. And we just have Sheamus just an inch from Adam Pierce, just his mouth yelling into his... Sheamus's mouth into Pierce's mouth. It was just like, ugh. It just doesn't feel right. Not to me. What could I tell you? In America, the pandemic's still really bad because our president was retarded at the time. Um... Now we've got a president who's much smarter, but some people make fun of him because he, he talks like the water just came back on. But still, he's a smarter guy. He's got to take your word for it. Okay. <laughs> Damien Priest is hanging out with Bad Bunny. And then Lacey Evans and Ric Flair. Ric Flair cut an actual promo. Like Ric Flair. Like, not like I'm the old man happy to see my daughter. Like, yeah, kind of like a Ric Flair promo. He, as Ric Flair, it was great. The see Ric Flair. He did say greatest sports entertainer. No, no, Lacey Evans said Ric Flair was the greatest sports entertainer of all time. I threw up a little, but that's okay. I'll let it go, because if that was... if I wish that was the biggest problem with this segment. Wow, there's a lot to unpack here. Where would we begin? So Charlotte... Charlotte arrives, naturally, to have an argument with her dad, although I'm not sure about what... And then Lacey Evans and Ric Flair kind of said their thing was casual, but I think they meant to say platonic. It wasn't really... <laughs> I think they tried to make it sound more innocent and actually accidentally made it sound worse. And it really looks like Lacey... Uh, well, I don't want to jump ahead. I'm not sure what they were yelling about. I don't think this helped anybody. Lacey Evans is trying. She doesn't do it at the levels of Alexa Bliss or Carmella, but she does put everything she's got into the nonsense they give her, and you have to at least give her credit for that. Rick was trying. I just don't believe that Ric Flair is really mad at his daughter and really wants to cost her victories in her career so he can train Lacey Evans, who pays attention to him, and, may, and still, we're not sure, may or may not be uh, having sex with his wiener. I don't understand. But we have a sneak attack from Lacey, and we do the match, Lacey, and Charlotte, and the winner gets to wrestle Oscar next week. Uh, Lacey pulls Ric Flair in front of her and stops Charlotte from kicking, and this match was orchestrated as if they're setting up Charlotte versus Ric Flair, which now I want to see, so damn it. Probably not a good idea. And Lacey Evans wins by disqualification. Charlotte just yells at her dad. And she snaps and she beats Lacey and ignores the referee's count. I like this because it reminds us that there are rules and that you have you have to listen to the referee or you, there's a consequence. God forbid. Which so sets up Lacey and Oscar and off. Oscar's an afterthought. Again, she's been the uh, yeah yeah the, the day after she she got the title from Becky becoming pregnant. That sounded weird, but you, you know what I mean. Like since she, the day, the day since the day she won the title, she was an afterthought. Even hell, even that segment, she was an afterthought. But uh, Lacey called her like a feral animal or something like that, which sounded a little odd. I thought Charlotte should have at least spoken up and go, "Hey, shut up. She's she's great. That's that was really awful or rude or something." Charlotte just didn't really seem to defend Oscar at all. I don't know. I don't think I cared for that. I don't think I cared for that. But, um, 
Sharn's supposed to be the other hammer next door. Okie dokie. Anyway, uh, the announcers accidentally poked a hole in the Charlotte Lacey match. Sorry to go backwards. A Charlotte Lacey match gets 634 stars. And um, Riddle and, and Keith Lee gets 912 stars. And AJ Lee and Jeff Hardy, AJ Styles, Jesus, and Jeff Hardy get uh, they get 38 stars, by the way. means nothing. The announcers accidentally poked holes in the theory, too. They, uh, I think it was Tom Phillips who ever said, uh, why would Ric Flair do this to Charlotte? All he's talked about for years is how happy is he is that Charlotte is the greatest of all time. You're right, announcer guy. You just told us why this doesn't make any sense. Oh, my mistake. It wasn't 620. It was 532 stars that Lacey and Charlotte gets. I apologize. I just ruined the whole podcast. Edge is talking about who he's going to choose to wrestle when he hasn't decided, and the Miz and Morrison show up with Angel Garza. Who gave Garza a haircut? He looks terrible. The long hair. I like him looking slimy. All right? He's pretty enough, but he looks slimy. He cut his hair. He looks like the, the Colon guys, Primo and uh, the other Carlito cousin. Is Carlito still wrestling? Was he on this? Uh, anyway, uh... Of the three of them, Miz, Morrison, and Garza, that, that I'm interested in, Miz does all the talking, and it's about him, and he's one of the people that's going to be in the Elimination Chamber. Uh, Edge pretty much taught Miz how to talk here with some believability. Instead of Miz really should teach the scripted promos class, if there's such a thing as scripted promos only class. Because uh, it's just so smooth and so s sterile. And Edge pretty much showed everybody how this works. Damien Priest arrives. Oh, yeah, the Edge just pretty much told Miz, you know, you got nothing on me. You're not thinking on my level. You, you just gave away your plan, first of all. And I'm gonna, he just told me that, uh, reminded me to be five steps ahead of you. So Edge walks off. The three of them stand up to thumbs up their anuses, uh, which will hurt their holes for later. It's the theme of the night. And Damien Priest arrives to do the, he defeats Angel Garza in a pretty good match. Oh, Bad Bunny arrives first. Uh, they're milking his bad bunny. I guess his merch sold really well on a website, so he's going to keep him around. Uh, Damien Priest was great. He showed the fire. I like that Garza took his pants off and threw it at bad bunny. Damien Priest was showing the fire, had the strikes. Uh, he does do that archer thing a lot. Like, it's a little like like Alexa does the hand of the, under the chins thing, like a lot. Like, somebody keeps telling her, do it, do it, do it. Like, don't, you're over... We get it, but you're overdoing it, and I'm worried about that. Uh, the refs throw the heels out. This was actually a good spot where the heels are goofing around, and rather than have Bad Bunny do like another dive and physically overpower the two the two heels on the outside, Bunny uses his smarts. He tricks them into chasing him when he swipes the briefcase, which makes the referee get mad at the heels and throw them out. So I'm fine with that. Does the guest celebrity guy doesn't physically make the, the, the guy heels look like wimps. He uses his smarts because he knows that they're hotheads and they're going to make mistakes. And then he hides behind the heroic babyface wrestler, which he did. So, cool. I'm fine with that. Got no issues there. Uh, Priest wins very quickly with his maneuver there. The Reckoning, which I think is the name of one of the Retribution people. So, is that me again? I think. I think. I don't know. I think so. Yeah. All right. Where are my notes? A lot of my stumbles. I'm sorry. Let me look at my notes. The match is 329 stars. 329. So Priest is on a streak here. They like him. Charlie Caruso is talking to Drew McIntyre. And... I for you must not say... I didn't write anything else. So he must not have said too much. I guess he's going to wrestle Randy Orton later. Uh, Bianca Belair is on Raw. And she is the EST. Once again, we're... We're beating it home a little hard. You know, Asuka shows up, and they both laugh about how she's going to beat up Lacey, which means Lacey's going to win. And then Bianca says she may challenge Asuka anyway, and then Asuka looks nervous. And uh, Poor Asuka. Because they just... She, I feel like she's blindly going out not knowing what she's saying, or she's just saying the things she... Like, she doesn't know the gimmick is. They're, they're almost kind of laughing at her, which I don't really feel too cozy with. 
I don't know if you, if I'm reading it wrong, you tell me. You tell me if you disagree. But I have like a I don't know. It feels like a bit of a poking fun at with her. Keith Lee and uh, Matt Riddle have a very good back and forth match. They're banging for the babyface match. Again, I was worried this wouldn't do many favors, but they both just told the story of Riddle's going to use his submission, his strikes, his MMA background. Keith is using his power, his power, his size, his intensity. He did a lot of curling Riddle with one arm and everything else. Uh, this was great. It was physical. I believed it. I didn't look down or look away or look at my phone much or anything like that. I was, I was, I was focused on it. So that's terrific. And uh, Keith Lee wins, and then they hug, and uh, Bobby Lashley attacks them both. And Lashley looked really impressive here. MVP was on commentary. I, I think MVP was great on commentary. I think he gave away a little bit that Keith Lee was going to win the thing. Uh, I didn't realize beforehand this was for a U.S. title match. Otherwise, I would have predicted the same. I thought they were just having a match. But MVP kind of tipped the hat a little bit, but still he was really good. I mean, here's a lesson. That everyone sh everyone should use this example of how to put over your opponent, so that when you do beat him, you beat somebody, and if they beat you, somebody beat you. MVP on commentary on February eighth, two thousand twenty-one. He never trashed their abilities, or that they weren't a threat. He just believed his guy was better, and he was going to show you why. And he was, and him and his guy were going to be sneaky dicks while doing it. Perfect. Not 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 a complex issue here. What happens, really? Oh, Lashley attacks. There's a big package uh, dangling over our foreheads of Drew and Orton and their past. Uh, Randy Orton enters. Drew McIntyre enters for the main event. Drew summons the Thundercats. They had a great two minutes of pro wrestling, and they had to cut Sheamus' music. But um, cue Sheamus' music. Sheamus runs out. But that created the distraction. Ended up still being a great pro wrestling match. I fully expected an Alexa Fiend shenanigans thing here. Didn't happen. Uh, a little surprise. They didn't mention it. Not on this Hulu edition anyway, which was odd because didn't she cost Orin a match against Edge a week ago by drooling the black stuff and then they just don't mention it? What is the issue? Did she get COVID? I don't fucking know. Uh, there was an errant, an errant rogue kick from Sheamus uh, intended for Drew, but it hit Randy. Claymore on Sheamus, but the match would be DQ'd. I guess Randy would win by DQ because he got kicked. Uh, they did a superplex from the second rope, which I love. I love second rope superplexes. I like them better than top rope ones. It just seems more believable, and they're quicker to set up, and they look not as cooperative. And really, you know, bump's pretty much the same. Like, come on now. I've taken them both in some hard rings. It doesn't really matter at that point. It's just people think it's more impressive to go up to the tippy top. If you're clearly helping each other balance, I don't know. I don't even hate the top rope ones. I'm saying I like a good old-fashioned second one, which is like his dad used to do. Cowboy Bob. Well, that was Monday Night Raw. So that match gets um, 74 stars. Let's talk about Nia Jax's hole. Good God. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So I saw this trending on Twitter, and I watched like a four-second clip, and I went, uh, all right. I thought the yell before was kind of comical, like, like she was trying to be funny. And then before I watched the uh, the YouTube WWE version, and I did, it's edited. They, they censor out the word hole. They beep it if you really need to know. But that's not what's important here. So she's. I'm watching a YouTube clip. So she misses the leg drop on the ring apron, which is the hardest part of the ring, by the way. It's the hardest part of the ring. So I'm not surprised it hurt her hole if it's the hardest part of the ring. You heard the song up top. <laughs> she was overselling comically. Well, let's back. I'm sorry. I mean, it starts off with her giving her given two big power bombs to Lana. The second of which was similar to the Dana Brooke one, where she's just being a, a shitty asshole. Nia takes soft, crumbling bumps and, and doesn't let the other people she's slamming take their own bumps and then just s smashes their bodies against the mat recklessly. I don't care. That's what is happening. Don't tell me otherwise. I've been there. So she's doing this, and then she sets up Lana. It's a table smash. The only way to win is to put your opponent through a table because they've been feuding with this table thing, which that actually does make sense. It's a gimmick match for this situation. Okay, fine. 
So Nia misses the leg drop on a ring apron, which is the hardest part of the ring, of course. And she's selling her butt. And like three or four times, she does like she does like an over the top ow, ow yell. She then then she yells ow my butt, then ow my hole, and that's what gets it. So she's doing a funny sell, and this is why she's doing a funny sell. She knows she's about to lose to Lana, so she needs to remind you it's bullshit before she loses to Lana. So she's just protecting herself. She's not putting Lana over as this underdog who finally stood up to the bully and defeated the bully in the old David Goliath situation. Which, side note, Goliath should have just won the first one, but David would have, like, victory and defeat, and they could have sold the rematch, made some actual fucking money. Not the point. And so Nia's over-the-top funny selling to remind you it's fake because she's about to lose. And she says, ow, my hole. And it's just so... Because she knows it's going to go trending, and and everyone's going to... People are just going to remember that she says, ow, my hole, ha-ha, and hilarious. And... That's what's trending, and everyone forgets that, not, that Lana wins the thing, which is what happens. Lana just shoves Nia, and Nia breaks, like, the very tippy edge of a table, which actually probably hurts a bit, but I have a lot of sympathies there. And, well, I think Lana had to fix a boob. She turned away, so I really shouldn't have said that, because now everyone's going to look at it, whatever. Now, you, you know, who cares? Um, that's what happened. I did not see Naomi, Naomi versus Shane. I have no idea what happened in that match. So this is what Lana was. Lana was protecting herself and not couldn't really put anyone else over and do what her actual job is supposed to do. I'm interested to see what, if any, are any reprimands for her very deliberately saying, ow, my hole. It's not like you stub your toe and you go, ah, fuck, like as a reflex. And you shouldn't have said fuck because maybe you're on live TV or whatever. It's not like, it's not like, yeah, you know, she, something like, like her hand got crushed in the steps or something. And she went, ah, shit. I fucking think, I, like, like, uh, now this was deliberate because she's selling comically for a minute beforehand. Ow, like, ah, 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 with a funny face. And then, ow, my butt. And then pause. Ow, my, so, it's, it was very deliberate. And now she's patting herself on the back and everyone's patting her on the back. Not near the butt, so you hurt her whole, you know, ring apron is the hardest part of the ring. So that's what I really think Nia did. My opinion of her clearly isn't good, but, um... That's what I think the real thing is. I don't care that she said my hole on TV. I don't care about Nia Jax's holes. Uh, I think it was to take the piss out of Lana's win. Because she had to lose to Lana, who she gets to physically brutalize all the time. Like, the first power bomb she gave Lana was like, okay, it was a big bump. I can justify that one. The second one, I'm like, you're doing it again. Wasn't quite as bad as the Dana Brooke one, but it was like, gee, Jesus. She's not taking her own fucking bump. You're, you're killing her. You're fucking killing her. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of things pissed me off. And again, I, just my taste, I'm not the biggest Lana fan in the world. But I think for politics and BS reasons of the Rusev Miro leaving and everything else, that they were kind of like, okay, so they're burying her. Not burying her on TV because they didn't, they didn't bury her. She won a Survivor Series match. She's on TV, so you're not really being buried if you're always on TV. But the nine tables in a row is they're cool, and they know Lana hurt. They know Nia hurts everybody. Whether I'm a fan of Lana's wrestling or not doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. She's she's another one who's, who's always trying to make chicken salad. Um, so let's be fair too. She's trying. Uh, I think is is a physical punishment, hoping she gets hurt, which is really reckless and dangerous. And I do not want her hurt. I don't want any bones broken. I don't want her having any concussions, which I'm, uh, which I'm really worried about with those goddamn bumps and everything else. Uh, big power bombs, I mean. Uh, yeah, I don't like it. I just don't like what they're doing to her. If you, don't, if you don't think she should be on your show, don't put her on your show. If you don't think she's a good wrestler, don't put her on your show. Don't try to kill her, all right? Everyone else you don't want there, you just let their goddamn contract run out now, and then you just don't re-sign them. If that's what they think Lana's worth, then fine, okay. But don't fucking hurt her and try to ruin the quality of her life. Because she's paying for her own goddamn insurance, right? Right? Look, I don't know if the A if she's married to Mira. I don't know if the AW guys have their own. And you could include the spouse. I have no fucking idea. As far as I know, she's, I would imagine she's paying for her own insurance. So... 
Not cool. Don't ruin the quality of her life. If you don't like her as a wrestler, you don't like her as a wrestler. If you don't think she should be on TV, don't put her on your TV show. Don't ruin her. She's a human. That's most important. It's also the hardest part of the ring. Oh, it's the hardest part of the ring. It's the hardest part of the ring. Sometimes you go over the top rope and you bang your hole on the ring apron. And that's when you feel like a big dope. Because they're the worst bumps you can be taking from Naya. It's the hardest part of the ring. It's the hardest part of the ring. Ba -da -ba -da.